you're on. Right. Hi, Mary. Hello, Rob. You're still alive then? I think so, but I'm not sure. Yeah, you're still kicking and moaning and making yes. lots of noise. Moaning, yes. So listen, uh, um, obviously, it's wonderful to, I say wonderful, it's quite nice to see you. Yeah? Yeah. How many years, I've got a load of questions here, right? How many years, before I even introduce you, how many years ago now did you overcome your metaphobia? Uh, hang a minute. Nearly seven years. Oh my God, seven years ago. All right. Yep. So it's seven years ago you overcame metaphobia. Yes. So this is your seven year checkup. Right. Yeah, we did another one, didn't we? Three or four years ago. Yes, we did. Fabulous. Okay, then let me introduce you. So, uh, everybody, this is Mary. Mary is really, really old, right? And she had a metaphobia for about 150 years. How long did you have it for? About 150, but I think it was 75 years. 75 years. And uh, um, you had it really badly, uh, as most metaphobes do. And you completely overcame it going to the Thrive Programme. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yep. So... I, I, we, we talked about this on, on the Metaphobia uh, 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 social media channels and things and asked people if they had any questions for you, okay? Now, yeah. I, um, I'll, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that your first video that you did when, when, I, when we first talked about your upcoming Metaphobia, that is our most watched video on our Metaphobia channel. Everybody knows Mary, okay? And yeah. every, honestly, and everybody, if I speak to people, they always say, oh, how's Mary? It's a bit, it's a bit like, um, you're, a, you're a star. Oh, okay. lovely. Good. You're, 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 yes. you, are, you are, you're a star. Can I just say, we are, I asked people to send in questions for you, okay? Yeah. And yeah. Um, hang on a sec. And most of them uh, didn't send in questions. They just wanted to say hello. Let me just tell you, hang on a sec. What they said. Here we go. Um, let me just tell you this, right? So we got about nine questions and about 15 comments. Mary was and continues to be an inspiration to me that was someone. Uh, um, she's a national treasure. You're a national treasure. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, if, they think, if they think so, I'm very pleased. <laughs> uh, what a uh, wonderful Mary. What a journey she's had. Um, uh, Mary, you are the reason so many of us are and were inspired to start the Thrive Programme. You are the reason so many of us kept persevering, even if we had a blip or two. So thank you for the amazing inspiration to become a metaphobia free. Hugs and love always. Absolute hero. Wow. So inspirational. I cried watching a video. Thanks very much. I would love to talk to her. I've been a metaphobe since I was 17. I'm almost 50 now and it's pure hell. So off the back of all that then, Wombat, why don't you start? Uh, um, I refer to you as Wombat. And, and uh, I didn't pick that name for you, okay? You, you, you invented that name. Yes, tell I us, did. Tell us why you invented that name and why, I think it's only me you really sign off your emails as Wombat. What, what's, what's that about? Well, you, when I first really sort of tied up with you and you got me to talk to some of your people that work with you, Yep. And you kept on rabbiting on about this old lady and how old I was. And you even threw in a question and asked how I coped in the First World War. And I decided I had to get my own back somehow. So Wombat, the letters of Wombat stand for Wily Old Mary. 
breathing and thriving. Breathing and thriving. The important thing is the fact that she was still breathing even then. <laughs> okay, so wily old Mary, breathing, alive and thriving. Bring it, but, yeah, breathing and thriving. Breathing. Yeah. Excellent. Good. Good, good, good. Now, before we go any further, I asked you, the, I spoke to you the other day to ask if you would uh, do this recording with me today. And um, I, I asked, I can't remember what I asked you. I did, I asked you a question about your beloved uh, husband, Edgar, who is no longer with us. And I was and am always ever astounded by your, your thriviness. You know, um, obviously you were devastated as anyone would be when your husband died, right? But I said to you, how did you not turn it into a positive? Because of course you can't turn that into positive, right? You might not even remember this conversation. I said, how did you, how did you process part of that as a positive? And do you remember what you yeah. told me? Well, it's a hope the same thing as you remember, but I honestly really loved my husband. I couldn't have known a nicer chap. And I was thinking, how am I going to cope? I've lost him. I have several friends who've had two, three, four terrible ma marriages. I've had one who was kicked and beaten and ended up in hospital. And I thought, I've got to think how lucky I was to have found such a lovely gentleman and a gentleman. And I've got to remember what, what he was like. And that, yes, I've lost him, but thank God I've got such lovely memories. And even now, because I've got his photo on the wall at home, and I look at it, and I just think, you were so nice, Edgar, you really were. And that's, I still wish he was here, especially in the pandemic when, when I'm on my own, but it's, it's switching my feelings to gratitude for him being so lovely. And he really was. And that's all I can say. Mary, I think, I think you, are, you are showboating now because you're on camera, right? Because when I asked you a week ago, how did you turn it into a positive? You immediately turned back to me and said, well, I've got twice the wardrobe space now. Ah, yes. That was the that, anecdote I was looking for. Ah, well, that's because I told you that a friend had asked me how I coped. Oh, right. Because okay. he, was, he was worried about when his wife died and I had to try and pick out things. But what I thought were benefits. OK. All right. OK. All right. I'll let you have that. And so um, you are... Um, you are our poster girl uh, um, for, for people that have overcome emetophobia. And of all the phobias and mental health... Can I just interrupt, oh, yes. Rob? Yeah. This poor old soul at this end is getting slightly mutton Jeff. Would you be very kind and talk up? <laughs> yes, I certainly can. Thank you. In fact, what I'll do, I'll just turn my microphone up as well, Mary. Give me one sec. Lovely. Um, do. Here we go. All right, I'm going to put that about there. How is that? Is that better? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's better. Thanks, Rob. Uh, okay. So, emetophobia is is the worst phobia in the world to have, uh, um, as you know. And it's, it's one of the hardest phobias to overcome. You also know that. And we are continually putting effort in to try and make the programme as good as possible, as easy as possible. Some people still struggle, obviously. Some people, you know, uh, we get more emails about emetophobia than we do about anything else. People, are, lives are devastated by it, as you know. Yeah. Mm. What... In your mind, what was the hardest part for you going through the programme 
and overcoming your emetophobia? What was the hardest bit that you got stuck on? It's a difficult one. I think because even when I was getting through the book, I would still, I was still sort of panicking like mad. And I, I think at first I was thinking, oh, you know, a couple of chapters in and, and I'll be cured. Um, I suppose also because I'd had a lot of psychiatric treatment during my life for this, I found it hard to believe it was going to work for me. Okay. It might work for all those other people that wrote, you know, how they got on. But I, I still, I think it took me a long way in before I really believed it would work for me. Okay. So it was your belief that it wasn't going to happen? Yes. Okay. All right. And just, just to remind people that may not have seen your earlier couple of videos, you, you, you didn't uh, see one of our coaches, although you did have a session with me later on, but you basically yeah. did the whole thing by yourself with the book. Yes, but you did. You had a couple of phone calls. Right, okay. And... I, I, remember, I remember very, very clearly when I first heard from you, um, you'd sent me an email asking me a question. And I think probably you, you waxed lyrical a little bit in your email and told a bit of a story, probably. And I remember getting this email. And I think you were 84 at the time. How old are you now? May I, may, is no, that I, was, I was 81 when you got me over it. And I'm going to be 88 shortly. <laughs> okay, so 81. So I remember, uh, I remember th that's right, because you'd had it since you were seven. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, this poor lady's had it so long. And I remember sending you a reply saying something along the lines of, just do this, this, this and this. And if you don't bloody do it, I'll drive down and I'll make yep. you do it. Was that, that fair enough? That was fair, fair enough comment, yes. Good. I also remember, the, uh, we had, we'd had, I know we had a couple of conversations, but the one actual session that we had was based around um, perfectionism. Sorry, about what? Perfectionism. Around... Oh, yes, yes, yep. Do you remember that? I do. Do you remember that you didn't think you were a perfectionist? <laughs> yeah. You, you, were about, you were making me a cup of coffee. Uh, yeah, and I spilt a bit and was going, oh, bugger shit. And, yeah. There you go. <laughs> and you twigged at that moment... Because you were giving yourself a hard time for spilling the milk or something, you realised yep. that you still were. Okay, let me ask you some of these questions. Right. Um, come out of that. Here we go. You've talked previously that when you did have a metaphobia, you avoided having chemotherapy for your cancer because yes. obviously you didn't want to be sick. Uh, horrible thought, really, but if you needed to have chemotherapy today, would you still be worried about it? No. I wouldn't, wouldn't fancy it because chemotherapy for a lot of people isn't very pleasant, but in some ways I wish they would because they ain't doing nothing for my cancer. Right. They're saying they can't do anything. And at least if they were giving me chemotherapy, I would assume they were trying to get me better. Yes, good point. But in terms of your, your worry about sickness or anything like that, that wouldn't... No. But when I had my first cancer, I will tell you that straight away, there was nothing about the cancer that worried me except having chemotherapy, nothing else about the cancer. I couldn't, couldn't, I didn't want to know. It didn't worry me. But all I had was a dread that I'm going to have to have chemotherapy. And to be honest, at that time, I thought I would far rather die and be done with yeah. than have chemotherapy. Okay. Well, we're all glad that you didn't, obviously. <laughs> um, and 
do you know, Mary, you know what it's like. Every emetophobe that's going to watch this video, you know, is going to think either you're a stooge, you're an actress, yeah. um, or, or, or that we're exaggerating. So, so I, I apologise in advance that I'm going to get you to clarify some of these things, right? Yeah, yeah just sure. For, just for clarity, Mary, if yeah. you had to go through chemotherapy right now, in mm-hmm. terms of being sick, would you be bothered at all? I don't think I would. No, I think, as I say, I've had other friends who've had chemo and they've they felt a bit rough. So from that point of view, but it wouldn't be this worry that, oh, God, chemo makes you feel sick because that it was like a one track mind for me. I've got cancer. They're going to give me chemo. Chemo makes you sick. Okay. And that, if you like, that was the whole thing in a nutshell. Which leads us nicely on to the second question that someone else asked. Bearing in mind, we talk about the fact that we have somewhere in the region of 50,000 thoughts a day. Okay. Yeah. When you had a metaphobia, what percentage of those thoughts every day? do you think were directly or indirectly related to being sick? It's very difficult to answer. A simple answer for me would be most of them. But uh, it was never really, I don't think it was ever out of my mind for very long because things that actually happened in your day would sort of trigger the feeling or I would suddenly think, oh dear, my tummy's rumbling, I think I feel a bit sick, oh god no, so it was kind of always, if you like, hovering in the background, waiting for a chance to jump in, so Uh, I would, to me, certainly most. Okay, and what about now? No, because, and I think that's part of thriving it's not only oh whoopee you know I don't mind being sick but I don't think you know I used to if if I wanted to go out with friends for a meal I'd have to start taking diazepam I would be panicking what if something was wrong with the meal and I wouldn't enjoy it now I don't think like that one of my friends will phone and say well, when we're not in lockdown, of course. You fancy so and so and so and so, we're getting together and going to go out for a meal. And I, oh, it's lovely to me. You don't, don't worry, you don't worry about it? No. And in fact, I was thinking the other day, I took some, some sort of a weird meal that I'd made out of the fridge. And it had been there a bit longer than I'd meant to leave it. So I kind of sniffed it. And I thought, oh, I think that's all right. And ate it. Believe you me, pre-thrive. No way, no matter what it smelt like, that would have been straight in the dustbin. I just ate it. Uh, Why do you think the Thrive programme worked for you when all the other treatments and psychiatric treatments and therapies and interventions, all those other things which are documented in your other videos, none of those worked. Why did none of those work? Why did Thrive work? Well, once I started to read the book, it's the first time anything to do with my fear started to make sense. I had weird treatments where nothing made any sense at all. I mean, I used to have a a Freudian dream therapy, and I can remember one, I dreamt about a pub called the the White Bear or something, and then my analyst analyzes that and says, that's because I thought my mother was a white bear. And I'd go away and think, what the hell has that got to do with... And I never had any form. I had some group therapy. Then I had an individual therapist, but he gave up because our very first ceremony, he said, what is your problem? And I said, a terror of being sick. 
Oh, he said, that's rubbish. Nobody likes being sick, and we all are, and that was the end of that bit. But, you know, if you're being, if you're, if you've got, say, a thorn in your foot and your foot's sore, you expect the treatment to relate to your sore foot and the thorn, not for someone to say, did you know your nose is running? Or, and it, <laughs> to me, it was five made sense virtually from the word go. Uh, and that, that, that hooked me because I knew from what you said at the beginning of the book, there might be bits I didn't think I agreed with, but that I had to go along with it. So to me, Thrive, is, somehow it shows you from the start, Rob, that it's looking into how you react, how you behave, why that's causing the problem. And nobody in national health hospitals and things was able to ever do that. Okay. Um, after beating your emetophobia, how did you cope with your most recent cancer diagnosis? Didn't, I was, I was not happy, obviously, but it didn't worry me in the least because a chemoth. Well, they did say it. I, they couldn't give me chemotherapy. I was too old, Rob. <laughs> um, no, it, okay. It's just here we go. We've got yet another health problem, and you just cope with it. There was no nothing to do with to me anyway sickness whether in the end of kidney cancer makes you sick i haven't got a clue i haven't really looked into it okay um so you got over your phobia seven years ago yeah um has it ever come back no it's not come back but there are things that I don't fancy, like something or other that was wrong with me. And a couple of years ago, they were talking about me having to swallow a camera going down my throat. And I will be honest, it wasn't the vomiting fear. I just thought, oh, my God, that sounds horrible. I don't <laughs> like that. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think most people would like that. But so, so I think this question's about the fact that when when people go through the program for their metaphobia, some people are uh, because there tends to be a really strong desire for control. They focus all on their metaphobia and not as much on thriving. So they tend to feel a lot better very very quickly, and then kind of take their foot off the accelerator a little bit. And I think they kind of, some people spend, you know, a few weeks, a few, a few months, some even a few years going in and out of minor sort of blips. They, 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 they go to feeling completely over it, feeling, oh, it's there again a little bit. It's gone. It's there again a little bit. We know now with all the data and everything we've got, that's because they, they didn't get themselves to the point that you got yourself to. Yeah. And you, you, you expounded upon this very very clearly in your second video three or four years ago and you said and I'm, I'm paraphrasing and you may or may not remember you said um whilst i believed being sick was terrifying i would rather die than be sick but the moment i reduced it from it's terrifying i could not cope to it's horrible but i would cope it went well, it, it, it set it going because I'd never, I'd never thought before it's horrible, but I could cope. And once I thought that, um, it was like a big shift in my brain. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I pardon the, you know, I cough from.
And in fact, to be honest, that cough has got worse. And had I still got the phobia, I would be in trouble because when I have bad sessions, I, I'm retching and retching and retching. And now the only time that worries me is if, if I'm out in a restaurant or somewhere. But if I'm at home, I just I have to put up with it. And there it is. Mary, forgive me. Do you remember, um, did you ever watch Only Fools and Horses on television? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the episode where Del Boy is in the market with his with his case trying to sell this elixir of life that's supposed to cure people of everything? Oh, vaguely, and, vaguely, and, yeah. And Grandad was supposed to have a bad back and two legs and hadn't been able to walk for 30 years. He took <laughs> one spray of this thing and suddenly yeah. he's going around dancing around the market. Do you remember that? There yeah. will be a metaphobes out there that think that's you. Oh. Okay. They oh. will think that we just grabbed some actress off the street or some old granny that were that uh, were paying. Uh, uh, hold on there, because if I was a brilliant actress, you wouldn't be able to afford to even take me on, Rob. Oh, well, that's true. That, that's true. That's fair enough. Um, but it's just made me laugh to think that. And you know this to be true, that some emetophobes feel so powerless that they cannot conceive that a person had it for 75 years and got over it. And they've had it for five years or 10 years or, or 20 years or 30 years. Yeah. And then here you are after 75 years. You didn't even see one of our coaches. You didn't even see a consultant. You bloody did it by yourself with a book. More or less, with a little tiny bit of help from our friend Rob. Yeah, but actually all we talked about was perfectionism, and that yeah. was the last little bit for you. Done, you'd done most of it by then. Yeah. Someone yeah. here has asked, how did Mary cope with the pandemic? Um, well, it was no problem. I mean, I was amazed that such a thing happened. Um. Presumably, you still remember the Spanish flu, do you? <laughs> probably, Rob. I probably remember what they all died of when they used to sing Ring a Ring of Roses and things. Yeah, I, I wouldn't but, be so rude. But my main thing with the pandemic was because I live on my own. And because some people, Rob, think I talk a lot... And oh, yeah, exactly. And having no one to talk to for a lot of time, I I believe I told you that I started in the end and talking to my teddy bears. And my friends all said, Don't worry, Mary, but do worry if any of them ever answer back. But I can't say the pandemic worried me. Mind you, I was pleased when I had my second flu jab. Okay. Um, and I didn't, I felt if you got it and you died, I felt that was cheating. That was not like you getting a normal illness. And I was determined I wasn't going to be cheated. Um, but no, I wouldn't say the pandemic worried me particularly. Okay, just touching on that determination then, because that is most of us that know you or have met you, that's what I think we think of when we think of you. You call it determination. We would call it maybe spirit, your personality, your attitude. You know, I'm a, pig, you, I'm a pig headedness. Yeah, that's a, a perhaps more accurate a, a way of describing it. But you, you genuinely want to be there to get that birthday card from the Queen in twelve years' time, don't you? You're, you're quite determined to get that. Somebody told me she stopped sending them. I don't know. But yes, I'm just, I, when I got my first cancer, long before I knew anything about Thrive, I said to myself, I'm going to make sure I live till I'm 100. And I went to a place that did believe in positive thinking and things. And they said, picture in your mind, being your hundredth birthday and getting your card from the Queen, 
and that will help you keep going. So, yes, so I've that's just, stuck in my mind. I've just Googled it, and it says here that you still do. <laughs> yeah, I still do. You, you oh, do. she still does. Oh, good. Right. That's nice. Um, yeah. Mary, this question uh, uh, from one of our viewers is about... Um, you had a metaphobia for 75 years. You overcame it when you were 81, 82, 81, you said. Um, do you have any regrets? And I think the question means, do you have any regrets of, of, of the part of life that you missed out on when you had your meto? Yes, I do. Go on. Well, I feel that in many ways, 75 years of my life was wasted. Um, I mean, I started out, I trained to be a teacher, junior school teacher, and I took up teaching. I loved it. I loved the kids. But unfortunately, kids of seven and eight had a habit of, please, please, some feel sick. Bleh. So within less than a year, I'd had to pack it in. And I wouldn't go, I wouldn't get on a boat. I once got on a boat and went on a holiday to France. <laughs> I spent all my time pretending to be ill and in bed because I was so terrified at the thoughts I'd got to get on the boat to go back again. And it's just that, because I never told anybody, by the way, and I used to think I was the only person in the world that had this. Um, and I just think whether I'd stuck in teaching or not, I don't know. But then I shifted into industry and I did do, to be honest, though I said that myself, I did very, very well. I got on well. Um, but sort of anything like friends and they it would be someone's birthday party and I would try and think of reasons not to go yeah, without yeah. offending them and at the party I'd see all the lovely rich cakes and things and I wouldn't eat any and people would say are you all right because you know and I just think I wonder what those 75 years would have been like if I'd been a more, more normal sort of person. Now, I think, and I'm reading into this, uh, I'm reading this, I think, I mean, I've shortened these questions to ask you, but I think what this what this lady was asking was, and, and I'm sure she'll write in if I got this wrong, um, because you'd had it for so long, are you sitting there every day thinking, oh, I've, blown my life because of this thing oh no i'm not no, but no. when i'm asked the question and i think about it then i think oh god you know what a waste on a day sorry on a daily basis mary would you have a couple of thoughts a day thinking regretting oh no i mean I, there would be many days when i didn't think about it if i'm having if i'm enjoying myself and doing whatever i'm doing no it doesn't kind of enter my mind but if somebody because I've told some of my friends nowadays that knew me before who didn't know that there's anything wrong if they raise something then it sets me thinking because yeah. 75 years is a bloody long time I don't know why I'm still here <laughs> I will be well, for a while God clearly doesn't love me um here's one for you uh so uh, My experience is that a lot of emetophobes, due to the fact they've tried lots of therapies and things in the past, have quite a lot of learned helplessness. And no matter how clear we make it on our social media and in the books and the manuals and everything, that Thrive is a doing thing. It requires doing. Occasionally we get an email saying, I've read the book three times and, I'm, and our reply is always, I always say to people, you could read the book a hundred times. Reading a yeah. book, you know, I, I could read a book on karate. It's not going to make me a black belt. I could read a book on flying a helicopter. It doesn't turn me into a pilot. Yeah. Doing it, doing it, practicing, practicing, practicing yeah. every day. So how yeah. much effort did you put in is the question. 
you get the book, you get the manual, you start reading it. How much effort did you put in every day? I think it took you about five weeks to get to the part where we spoke and you were 90% over it in about five weeks, right? How much effort did you put in in those five weeks? Quite a lot because I, my answer was like you say, your answer would be reading the book is no good. And I did take the heart. I can't remember all of the book now, obviously, but you said somewhere at the beginning about you must do it all, even if you don't agree with it. And that stuck in my mind, really, that if I want to finally kill this bloody thing, I've got to stick. Because I do tend to be a person that will take advice or read a book on something. And I will admit, sometimes I think, oh, they've got it wrong. They might be an expert and they've written their book. And I sort of feel that I know better. And I did think I can't do, you know, I have to stick with this. Otherwise, if it doesn't work when I get to the end, I won't know if it would have worked if I'd done it properly, let alone Perfect. anything else. Perfect answer. So I'm going to pin you down on this because that's exactly what people, you know, people are going to watch this and go, how much did you do? How much did you do? How much on a daily basis, how many minutes, how many hours a day, average it out, did you spend thinking about the program content, doing it, looking at your beliefs, challenging your thinking, putting efforts in? How, how many hours or minutes a day did you spend? It's difficult to say. And I would, yeah, I can, I've got to average it out, obviously. I think, I think it's possible about two hours a day, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. To be honest, Rob, it's hard now to think back. But I did. I used to sort of reread and reread the chapter and look at some of the challenges. You know, what what was I going to do? Um, so. Uh, Mary, that, Sorry, and yep. what you're talking about, you're talking about you would spend, on average, two hours a day with the book, is what you mean, yeah? Yeah. Okay. But actually, during the rest of the day, it would still be on your mind, yeah? Oh, gosh, yes. Okay. Very much. So you've got to add that in. I'm talking about everything. Uh, yes. When, uh. when Thrive and Thriving was on your mind... How much was thrive and thriving and learning to thrive and pushing yourself and driving yourself? How much was that on your mind each day for those five or six weeks? Oh, I should think five or six hours. Okay, good. Because in everything you're doing, even like when you saw me spill the tea and I was doing a lot of criticising myself, so anything like in the kitchen, I'd cut my finger when I was cutting a carrot or something and I'd start straight on your silly bloody, pardon me all the people watching, but the right. silly bloody cow, that's how I used to think. And then I'd, I'd immediately think, hang on, hang on, hang on, I mustn't, I must, I mustn't think like this. I'm, I'm creating myself into this person. So yeah, different things you were doing in the day would automatically or they would with me sort of pull my mind forward to thinking you shouldn't be doing this you're making your problem worse so good. yeah I would think quite a large part of good. every good. day good because we do talk about it's it's the application of effort you know yeah. uh, it's, yeah. it, it, it's you know uh, um, the techniques, the insights will, will help anybody, but you, you know, you've got to throw, you know, you, you, you know, I think you said last time when I asked you the question I asked you a minute ago about how many thoughts a day, you said most of them a, a, a minute ago, but when I asked yeah. you a few years back, I think you said 90%, something like that, 90% of your thoughts. That's 49,000 thoughts a day. 
That's yeah. a lot of thoughts, right? That's yeah. a lot of thoughts. But let's say it's not that. Let's say let's say it wasn't even 80%. Let's say it was only 50%, right? That's still 25,000 thoughts a day yeah. that are directly or indirectly related to this phobia, pumping yeah. air into that balloon, throwing petrol on that bonfire, making this thing bigger and bigger and bigger. So yeah. with something like a metaphobia, you do have to put loads and loads and loads of effort in, don't yeah. you? Every yes. day. And the yes. thoughts that are there, they're coming, coming, coming after you. You, you, you have to really apply yourself and keep doing it don't you and then you have the setbacks and you have the difficulties and you hit brick walls and you have to just keep going through that is that correct That's, yeah and you see there's another point there and i think all the emetophobias people they must be genuine in what they're saying but the effect my emetophobia had on me i would do virtually anything if I thought it would get me over it. It was it was the worst thing in my life, let's put it that way. And I can't understand, I knew a young lady once, not long ago, who started doing Thrive, and her attitude was, you can't be expected to do all this. And I thought, hang on, do you really have a metaphobia? Because to be honest, Rob, if you had it like I had it, you literally would do anything. If you had money, you'd give it away. And I find it hard when people start saying, oh, I can't give time to it. And I think, well, have they really got a metaphobia? Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Because um, uh, also that's that would be another thought uh, from a monetophobe watching this that hasn't seen your earlier videos they might be thinking well she probably never had it that bad but you had it really bad oh i definitely like with that my first cancer i mean it when i say i would have died in fact i was working out if i'd got any anything i could use that if it came to the crunch I could kill myself before I had to have chemotherapy. Literally, and that was nothing to do with depression or, I could not, I, I honestly, when I felt sick, I mean, I used to be, I'm not a religious person. <laughs> I used to be praying to God to stop me and I, anything, I was in a terrible state and I, I really cannot understand anybody can actually have real full-blown emetophobia unless they're willing to put the time in. Yeah. It okay. would be like if you were totally paralyzed in a wheelchair and somebody said, we've got this new treatment, but for three years, you've got to, I don't know, stand on your head every day and waggle your feet about. If you were paralyzed in a chair and that was going to cure you, you would do it. I agree. Um, done that one. What is your message to other people who want to beat this phobia? My message, first of all, is please stick with the course. Do it all. Do all the exercises, the actions, and it's silly to say really, but try and build up a determination that you are going to stick with it and it is going to work. I mean, I've, I've heard people say that a lot of the recommendations that you get for the course, I've heard people say they write them all themselves, you know, mm. and I think I rather doubt that somehow. <laughs> I doubt if any of you lot have time to sit and write all that lot. Um, but you've got you've got to go into it, I think, wholeheartedly. You've got to think right at this moment in time, this Thrive course is going to be the most important aspect of my life. And if it means that you give up. I don't know why you should, but give up going away on holiday or giving up doing things because of the Thrive course, to me, 
do it, put, there's a saying, put thrive first. Mm, I like that. You've got to, it, how can you, how can you so desperately want to get over something if you then find it all takes too much time? Yeah, it's a funny one. I've, I've had people say to me, um, you know, Rob, I, I, I get up at seven in the morning, I get the girls up, I take them to school, I work all day, I pick the girls up, I feed them, I do their homework, I put them to bed, and I'm shattered when I go to bed, I haven't got any time. And I say, look, I, I appreciate that's a long day. Get up at six o'clock. Yeah. Get up at five o'clock. Yeah. You know, how badly do you want to be over this thing? That is the point, Rob. I think for a lot of people, that doesn't rule out that a lot of people do want to badly get over it. But you, it, well, to me, like the, the phobia was the worst aspect of my life. Well, similarly, here's your chance with Thrive, and you can read a lot of write ups, and you can see it does a lot of good. You've got to now make Thrive the priority. I'm not sure if you get to the end. Well, I suspect what you've always said, if you get to the end and you're no better, probably missed something quite important. Yeah. Um, so the time doesn't matter. Yes, you've got to fit your life around it. But I mean, let's face it. Most things that we do, there are ways of shortening them, getting a friend to help. Maybe you've got a, the one that's got to get their kids to school. Maybe somebody else in their street takes their kids to school and you have a word and you don't have to go into detail, but say I'm on a, a course at the moment for my health. And I'm wondering if you could take my kids to school and pick them up. Yes, you know, like prioritise it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It has to be the most important thing in your life. Yeah. I said to someone recently, it has to be the most important thing in your life for the next six, seven weeks. I said, and if you can't do that, don't even start the programme now. Yeah. Wait, yeah. wait until you can do that. And yeah. then, then, because, you know, you've been like it for 40 years waiting another six weeks until it's half term or till you can do it justice because yeah. you don't want to get to the end after putting 50% effort in yeah only and to think oh if I'd have only put a bit more effort in it might have worked might have worked yeah. okay um no regrets I think that's all of our questions look at that miss there's one more no that's it so What impresses uh, us uh, um, in, in the Thrive Programme so much about you is your positivity, your attitude, your, your resilience. You know, you, 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 you do embody everything that is thrivey. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Rob. Well, you do. You do. You do. Uh, um, how much effort does that require? Because... I, when I talk about thriving to people, um, and quite often, particularly emetophobes, um, but anyone else who's got a lot of perfectionist thinking, they, they wrongly assume that thriving means having a perfect life, that thriving means being ecstatically happy every day, and every day is a wonderful, joyous day. But you and I know that's not what thriving means. Thriving, <laughs> thriving is what you do. <laughs> every day yeah thriving is what you do every day to make the best of that day you know you, yeah. you could be in hospital suffering from covid you could have a terminal illness you could you could um be broke you could not have any food on your plate you know you could you could be in any situation thriving isn't your situation thriving is what you are doing to make the best of that situation sorry that was well, a long-winded explanation the question is how much effort does it take for you to keep yourself up here, to keep yourself thriving every day? Sometimes it does because I've got health problems and some evenings can be, to me, if I don't think carefully, unbearable. 
and I don't know if I've mentioned this, but certain problems, they can't, there's nothing that can be done. And I invented a thing now where I, if I'm having a real bad time, I say to myself, right, you know nothing's going to make it better. You give yours, or I give myself two choices. I'm either me, Mary, with my restless legs, I'm coughing and retching, I've got skin complaints that are itching like mad. I either accept those and that I live in a reasonably comfortable home. Now, I've certainly got everything I need, even if I haven't got everything I want. Or the other bit of the choice, if I don't accept that, is would you rather live in somewhere like Syria, in a bombed out town where you've got no proper housing, no doctors, no nothing, but you might not have all your health problems. And I straight away think, I'll accept being Mary with all the problems. Yeah. And this may sound silly, but just going through that action helps me to get through that evening. Well, it, it doesn't sound silly because what you're doing is getting perspective. Yeah. I was talking to a friend this morning, you know, if if you're feeling uh, anxious uh, one day going into the, a meeting or going to for check up with your doctors, just remind yourself of everything you have got in your life. Yes. Yes. It, yes. It might be, you know, really shitty for you during lockdown, particularly with people that are stuck in high rise flats and didn't have a garden or anything like that. Oh yeah. And that was yeah. awful. But what have you got? You know, I'm still alive. There's food in the fridge. There's a roof over my head. This thing's going to end at some point. But sometimes you do need to do that. You know, it, that's my whole point, really, that thriving is an active process. Sometimes it's very, very easy. OK, yeah. sometimes if you're having a difficult evening or your restless leg or your whatever, you need to put in effort. I altered a saying which was always look on the bright side. And at the time I had a little card, I don't know if it will show actually, but it now, it later on said, always look on the bright or brighter side. Because I realized that if you are in a lot of pain and things, you do, your mind is saying, oh, shut up, there isn't a bright side. And I, th I think I know this is silly, and I don't think I don't think there's any way you could see. Yes, 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 we can see that. <laughs> yeah, that's great, because because what you're, doing, you're you're making you're making it impossible for yourself to not embrace the fact that you, there is a bright there is still a brighter side. There might not yeah. be a lovely bright side right now. No, but there's certainly a brighter side than this. Well, I found that was a help when I was getting nasty health problems because I was beginning to think it's all very well trying to thrive but when you've got this bloody awful pain and your legs are kicking about and you know all the things it's very hard then and you could just try and say to yourself oh this is silly I'm cheerful because you're not so it to me anyway what just adding that or brighter side, again, if I'm thinking about thriving, that helps because yeah, I straight yeah. away think, hang on, okay, whatever it is, I don't want to go to the hospital and see this specialist, but I'm bloody lucky in a way that we have hospital and we have a specialist. And I don't know, perhaps that's just me, but I, <laughs> I just find that realizing that you can look for the brighter side as well as the bright side makes a huge difference. Yeah, yeah I get that. Mary, uh, that's all our questions. Have you anything else you'd like to add or anything else you'd like to say in under an hour? <laughs> Don't be so cheeky. <laughs> I just would like to wish anybody who watches this not we can't wish you good luck because thrive doesn't allow that but i just wish that you'll all find the ability to progress through and get better because 
it's a crap bloody thing to suffer from when you think of it. And it, it doesn't get you any sympathy or anything because anybody that finds out thinks you must be so stupid. Yeah. And I just, as I say, I can only hope that you all find, or you've got to believe that most of the people that write about what's happened to them are telling the truth. And I can assure you, um, I don't know how I can assure you, if you spoke to some of my friends, because they all agree that I'm nutty, but I'm, I've got no smashing friends. And during the lockdown, neighbours, even brand new neighbours, both sides of me, we're in every day. Can they get shop shopping? Is there anything? There's a good world out there. And you've got to try and enjoy it. And Thrive helps you, let's face it, to enjoy it. So please, all of you, stick with it. Um, as I say, I don't know how to show you that. I can't show you that I'm normal because I'm not. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> <laughs> but how can I prove well do you really think if I was a good actress all I would be doing is spending my time talking to silly people with a metaphobia it's, it's, it's unbelievable I think you know Rob that <laughs> I'm as normal as possible and that I'm not an actress or um mm. I'm me. Well, and I, I, I think I think you probably are an actress, but I, but I don't think you're acting now. Well, on top of that, some years ago, you you ran a, a thing in London on a Sunday. There's a lot of people who were new to thinking of Thrive came along. Do you remember? I do. Yes. Yeah. And uh, when I first came in. There's obviously, I don't know anybody that's going to be there other than Rob. And people kept running up to me and saying, hello, Mary, and throwing their arms around me because there was no COVID then. And I must admit, it was a lovely feeling. And the only thing I've tried to think more recently is if we talk about regretting 75 years if by talking about my experiencing, if I can help people to get over this horrible thing, then there was some point in it, perhaps, you know, instead of me just writing it off. It served the purpose. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. But as I say, I'm not normal. I'm as potty as they come, but uh, I'm certainly not an actress. I can talk a lot, and um, Rob will tell you yeah, that. You, you certainly can. Mary, that is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, no doubt we'll be speaking in another four years, and we'll do we'll do this again. Uh, um, yep. But for now, can I say thank you very, very, very much indeed. If anyone has any other questions, we can uh, I, we can talk about it on the phone. I can email them to you or something. Um, yep. But for yep. now, uh, thank you very, very much for your time. I'm just going to stop the recording now.